Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have come together to worship our gracious God, and there is joy in worship when we sing uh, to our Lord and Savior. And uh, what the other thing we're doing as a congregation is celebrating our koinonia that we have with one another. We talked about koinonia last week in our sermon series as we move through the book of Acts uh, this year. But it is a great joy as we worship our gracious God and Savior. Some thoughts about uh, Jesus this morning instead of reading a psalm. Uh, Jesus is in, uh, on his way to Jerusalem, and he's going through some grain fields on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees were a little bit upset with him uh, because they thought he was breaking a Sabbath rule. And Jesus' comment is this, I tell you one greater than the temple is here. They really didn't understand that at that time, uh, but we'll be talking about that in our message this morning on Acts chapter 3. And then John backs up that comment of Jesus in the Gospel of John when he said, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. May God bless your worship experience together this morning. I encourage you to read the prayer in preparation for worship this morning. It's praying at the top of your bulletin.
stand if able? You all can stand. We come together as the people of God. We offer our hearts, our voices, our lives in worship to the Father, Father the, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord our God. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. For the, God, for the Lord is a great God, our Savior and Redeemer. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. In his hand are the deep places of the earth, the strength of the hills, his in his also. The sea is his, and he made it, his hands formed the dry head. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. So give us. All give us a time and silence for our personal reflections. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us on the cross. If we claim that to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us. It is God's desire that we be holy as He is holy. But if, if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. The Lord is No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Rather, the law makes us conscious of our sin. God, I am your dear Lord, for I am born in thee. Your mercy is abundant to all who call upon you. The word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It judges the attitude and thoughts of the heart, exposing us for what we are. He knows everyone and everywhere. Everything about us is fair and wide open to the all-seeing eyes of our living God. Nothing can be hidden from Him, to whom we must explain all that we have done. Almighty God, creator of all things, judge of all people, we admit and confess that we have turned away from your path and promise to follow. We have thought evil thoughts. We have spoken unspeakable words. We have not applied your word to our behavior. Our obedience has been sloppy. Our love for our neighbor half hearted. Forgive us all the past and set our feet upon the true path of our life. Great is God's mercy to all who call upon him. The righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ. To all who believe, God presented Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for, of atonement for the sin. And so all who believe are justified freely by His grace. God placed on Jesus all your sins at the cross and transferred to all who believe His righteousness through faith. You are forgiven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated. The first reading today is from Isaiah, chapter 65. It reads, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I, found, I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, Here am I, here am I. All day long I have held out my hands 
to an obstinate people who walk in the ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations, a people who continually provoke me to my very face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burn incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil, who eat the flesh of pigs and whose pots hold broth of impure meat, who say, keep away, don't come near me, for I am too sacred for you. Such people are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that keeps burning all day. See, it stands written before me. I will not keep silent, but will pay back in full. I will pay it back into their laps, both your sins and the sins of your ancestors, says the Lord, because they burned sacrifices on the mountains and defied me on the hills. I will measure into their laps the full payment for their former deeds. This is what the Lord says, as when juice is still found in a cluster of grapes. And people say, don't destroy it. There is a blessing in it. So will I do in behalf of my servants. I will not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, those who will possess my mountains. My chosen people will inherit them. And there will my servants live. This is the word of God. The second reader uh, epistle today is from Acts chapter 3. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. At three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. Where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Peter said, look, look at us. So the man gave gave them his intention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk, taking him, in, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he walked with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. Let us rise for the reading of the gospel lesson. This gospel lesson from chapter 8 in the gospel of Luke. uh, Jesus has uh, crossed into the area of the Gerardines, which is a Gentile area. So he did not limit his miracles just to Jews in uh, Cana and the other area. But uh, he's now crossed uh, the Sea of Galilee into Gentile territory to do the same miracles and work. Luke chapter 8. They, referring to the disciples and Jesus, sailed to the region of the Gerizines, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and they gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. 
When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at the feet of Jesus, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. And then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated for the singing of the message hymn. in peace be multiplied unto you from our risen Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, your word is our treasure and we ask that you would enable us to not only speak your word this day but hear it as well. To the glory of your name. Amen. Let us share that text that's uh, printed for us this morning. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In our sermon series through the book of Acts, we have come to chapter 3 and God is on the move. There are now 3,120 new Christians in Jerusalem. It's a new reality. And so I have some photos there uh, in our bulletin this morning which shows you an example of Solomon's colonnade. And it really rings three sides of the Temple Mount. And the next picture, of course, shows how many people could be in just one area. And so, uh, easy place for 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 people to come and worship every day at the time of prayer to their Lord and to their God. And these new Jewish Christians uh, who were just baptized a few weeks before, They don't stop going to the temple in Jerusalem at the time of prayer just because they now are Christians. No, they're going there to worship, as always. Acts chapter 3, we find Peter and John going up to the temple at the time of prayer and 3 in the afternoon. I was always thinking, what is going through their mind? 
my gosh, you got 3,000 people that are now Christians, and what am I going to say? Or how many questions are they going to have? It's only been a couple weeks. And they're trying to think in their head about what they're going to say and what they're going to teach. Because no doubt, the temple complex has become one of the meeting places for the new Christian community. Even though uh, there are 12 gates in which people could enter to the Temple Mount, we are told that Peter and John chose to go through the gate called Beautiful. The Jewish historian Josephus described the gate as made of fine Corinthian brass, 75 feet high, with huge double doors, so beautiful that it greatly excelled the other columns that were covered with silver and gold. In the first century, beggars were not allowed inside the temple. But they were placed on the steps leading up to the temple complex because everyone knew that you earned credit from God when you gave gifts and alms to the poor. This gate was used by the wealthy and the well-connected. It was the most beautiful. And they were the cream of society. And they needed to show their generosity to those who are poor. Luke tells us that this man had been placed on these steps near this gate for over 40 years. That means that this man was there begging when Jesus came to the temple. Why didn't Jesus heal him? Could have. He walked right by him. But he chose not to. We know that Jesus healed thousands, but not everyone. And so we come to Acts chapter 3, and this is the very first miracle of the disciples as a result of the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was no longer physically present, but the Holy Spirit was in the disciples and was guiding and directing them. I'm sure that the Spirit uh, told Peter to act. It was just sort of automatic. If we listen again to uh, this section of Acts chapter 3, it says... Uh, Peter and John approached the temple and there was a man who was crippled there. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And so the next verse is that you have this connection with their eyes. You know, how many times do we see people on the street corner? Do you get their eye or do you not? Because if you get your eye, you're going to give them money. So that's what's going on. Peter looks straight at him as John. Look at us. The man expected to receive money. And Peter said, no, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Peter didn't think that himself. They were just going to the temple with other things on their mind, about 3,000 people they're ready to talk to. And all of a sudden, they see this beggar there. It's automatic. The Holy Spirit just spoke to him, and he reached down his hand and acted because the Holy Spirit was causing him to act. God is on the move, and he's now using the disciples to to continue to proclaim the good news of forgiveness through Jesus. The sacrifices that are happening in the temple are now outdated. Jesus has become the substitute for the temple sacrifices. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees thought they had, you know, finally gotten rid of Jesus. His public ministry, his miracles always drew attention away from them. They were envious. Besides, he was a rabbi without climbing the right ladder. He had no authorization from the Jewish uh, professors and Pharisees to teach. Jesus challenged their behavior for three years and called them hypocrites, whitewashed tombs. He said, you guys look good on the outside, but you're full of dead men's bones on the inside. He claimed to be God in the flesh. How radical is that? I mean, you and I have heard that phrase all of our life. And so we just sort of, yeah, Jesus was God. But you got to stop and think, even for us, how radical that is, that God himself came into the person of Jesus. It's radical. 
He claimed the authority to forgive sins and judge the world. Oh, they had had enough. They convinced Pilate to use Roman authority and he was crucified. That should have been the end of the Jesus story. His claim of deity was a good reason to arrest him, put him on trial, and silence him. But Jesus rose from the death in the grave, and now, in effect, there are two temples in Jerusalem. One made of stone by human hands, and the other one made out of human hearts in which the Holy Spirit now dwelt. The Jews understood that the temple was the one place on earth where heaven and earth connected. And that's where you receive forgiveness of sins. The temple offered forgiveness of sins every day when there was a sacrifice, when the lambs were offered. And now Jesus, the real temple, the real sacrifice, claimed forgiveness and healing because of his resurrected body in the church has become the temple of God on earth. Now it has 3,120 people. Acts chapter 3 not only contains the first miracle by the hand of Peter, but it brings them into conflict with the temple authorities because of this demonstration of power. And the Pharisees did not believe that Jesus could be nor should be the substitute for forgiveness. Well, almost a century ago, Procter and Gamble started to receive letters from very enthusiastic customers. And each one of the letters contained a question because they were so excited and they wanted to buy more soap that floats. And they wanted to know where they could find it. They had become enamored with this ivory soap and it helped them keep from sloshing around in that bathtub looking for that bar of soap that was always slipping away. So they wanted to know where they can get more of that ivory. So the executives knew they had a very good thing going. And so they quickly uh, went public with the story of how a factory workman unintentionally left a liquid batch of soap mixing a little bit more than normal and whipped in air into the product. It was an accident that happened. It was a winning product. By 1890... More than 30 million bars of ivory soap were being sold every year. And Procter & Gamble knew they had good news. But there was also bad news. And that is that other companies had kind of figured out how to make floating soap. <laughs> and so what Procter & Gamble did, they wanted to keep their market share. And so they put out a public uh, uh, program. They launched an awareness program. And it says, be aware of imitators. Except... No substitutes except ivory. Consider the situation of Australia-born Doris Grunewald, who at the age of 22 found that she was not a blood relative of the people who she thought were her parents. It was a shock to Doris and to her parents, who never imagined that when they left the hospital two decades earlier, they had been given the wrong child. Now let me ask you, if you were Doris's parents, what would you do? The hospital combed its records and came up with a list of 200 babies that might have been accidentally swapped. So to Grunewald's biological parents and to these other 200 families, they offered them a free DNA test to see if it was really their child. Out of the 200 possibilities, only 30 families came forward to check things out. 30 out of 200. Why was the figure so low? Well, it's simple. Families and these young women didn't want to be given a new family, and they did not want substitute parents. Except no substitutes. That's the truth, except you and I live in a disposable age. Contact lenses, plastic silverware, plastic containers for takeout restaurants, aluminum foil, Christmas wrapping paper, tens of thousands of other items are designed to be used and then replaced. For such products, substitution is the name of the game. But according to Peter and John, 
in Acts chapter 3, accepting no substitute except Jesus is the only way to be sure of salvation. As the beggar reached for Peter's hand, hoping for money, Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he reached out his hand, and the man stood, and his feet and his ankles, uh, atrophied by years of disability, were immediately made strong. Oh, it was a special moment. <laughs> and that excited cripple went into the temple for the first time, laughing and jumping and shouting. It was a time he was positively giddy. Probably like you were when you had breakfast in bed this morning. <laughs> this was an instantaneous change. It transformed his life. It was a special day for those in church, or I should say the temple, that morning. Because they saw and they recognized that this was the beggar who had been out on the temple steps for years. And now they were listening to him and they were watching him point at these two fellows who said, in the name of Jesus, the impossible was made possible. And so the crowds automatically approached Peter and John, but they had to set things straight. No, they said, we did not do this miracle by our own power or piety. This fellow was healed by the power of Jesus. You remember Jesus, don't you? Jesus is that fellow who was sent by God to save you from your sins and rescue your soul from eternal death. Maybe you also remember how that, uh, well, he was put on trial for his life just uh, a couple months ago because you called for his death. On that day, you accepted a substitute for your Savior. You guys asked the Roman governor Pontius to crucify Jesus and free a substitute the murderer Barabbas. You accepted the substitute and Jesus ended up dying on a Roman cross. But the cross was not the end of the Jesus story because three days later after he died, the living Lord Jesus came out of the tomb and let the world know that he is the world's savior and anyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus is responsible for saving this crippled man. He is also responsible for, for saving you from an eternity away from God. Today, you and I in our culture see all kinds of substitutes being promoted and accepted over the crucified and risen Redeemer. There are numerous religions that tell you that through the sacrifice, your sacrifice, and your self-discipline, you must save yourself from the day of judgment. Jesus resisted every temptation which seduces us. Jesus conquered death which defeats us. And Jesus alone is the only one who can carry your sins and minds, those broken commandments, to the cross. That's radical. And that's the good news. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So don't go out there accepting some other tricky substitute because there won't be peace in your heart. He is a true substitute we need. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God surround you and keep your heart and mind growing in the faith of our Lord and Savior. Amen. We continue with the next hymn an appropriate hymn uh, for our thought from this passage today as we receive our offerings.
Let us rise for the confession of faith, which prints for us in our order of worship. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From that she will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, you are a wonderful and gracious Father. And we thank you for the power of your word and the gift of your spirit, always pointing us to the uh, true piety and morality that we as fathers must maintain as we imitate you uh, in the world in which we live and for our families. And we ask, Lord, by the power of your spirit, you would enable us to continue to do so on our earthly journey. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. And Heavenly Father, we pray for those uh, in Ukraine who have lost homes or family members. And we pray for those who are in the, involved in the ministry of serving and caring for those who are displaced. And we ask that you would continue to give all those who are serving strength and care and that your love might bring peace to their land. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Heavenly Father, you are very much aware of those in our hearts and in our congregation who are in the hospital or who've had surgery, and we ask that you would bring about the wisdom to the physicians and researchers so that care and healing might come to their bodies. And so we leave them in your hands this day. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, for all who are traveling uh, throughout this land, members of our own parish and extended families, we ask that you would envelop them, hold them in the palm of your hand, and keep them safe until they return to their families here. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God the Father, through the lives of fathers here on earth, you have carried out your plan to lead families into your word of truth. From generation to generation, our, our fathers have been blessed by you. God the Father, through our ancestors Abraham, you brought a holy nation to life. God the Father, through King David, you brought prosperity and wealth to the children of Israel. Bless our fathers with resources to provide for their families in good times and bad. God the Father, through Joseph of Nazareth, you fulfilled the prophecy that Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. Bless our fathers with obedience to your will for the future of their families. God the Father, of your son's suffering and death, you brought us back into the relationship with you. And by him we now can cry, Abba, Father. Bless our fathers with the desire to be drawn closer to you. Give them wisdom and patience of their past and marriage. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of Almighty God into your hearts and into your homes. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated for the singing of our closing hymn.
Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.